Welcome to the Paranase Paradox. Thanks for tuning in. A few weeks back, I interviewed my friend Professor Aidan Gregg, who's a professor of psychology, a research psychologist at the University of Southampton, which is just outside of London. And we had an interesting conversation. We talked for about three hours talking about psychopathy, sociopathy, antisocial personality disorder, and Professor Gregg's own idea of what he calls a poco curante, which more vulgarly stated is a person who just doesn't give a shit. So somebody who doesn't care about the future or themselves in the future or other people or the truth. And that relates to the concept of psychopathy. So we won't get all the way into that. But in this episode, we'll talk about the introduction, the idea of a psychopath, sociopath, antisocial disorder, and how these ideas relate and, and overlap. So Aiden will tell us some of the history and also some of the ways that these things are classified. It's a very interesting conversation. I think you get a lot out of it. Let's get into it. <laughs> Very good. Not when we feel like it. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, we're going to discuss psychopathy. One of the things, though, I, after thinking about it for a while and and meditating on it, I always feel I need a kind of mental cleanse. I, mm. I need a, I need a sorbet uh, because yeah, it does get a bit heavy. It's a, it's a very heavy topic, and um, yeah, it's sort of you know, uh, as Nietzsche says, if you look into the abyss, uh, the abyss starts looking into you. And I I think there's something about psychopathy. At a, at a at a deeper level that is a bit like looking into the abyss if you are not a psychopath. And we'll be talking about some of the particulars. But I, I often feel that, you know, no matter how much you analyze some phenomena, getting to the essence of it, you never quite get to the essence of it. And But you have a sense of where it's going. And I'm, I'm not speaking particularly scientifically, but I think with psychopathy, you, you get the sense of this, this, this abyss opening up that you can't quite get your head around. But nonetheless, is is it's kind of empty and a, and a bit and fairly scary. Is it something uh, rather alien to most people? Yes, the word alien captures it. It's 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 alien, and um, it means you can't relate to it. Um, it's it's a certain there's a certain aspect of it that you you can't quite fully get your head around, or you can't quite fully grok. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a, a book called um, by he- I think it's Heinlein, um, "Stranger in a Strange Land," about a Martian. And um, the Martian, certain things are explained to him about about human life, um, and then he says, "Well, he fully grocks them, and he has this feeling of satisfaction." Um, so I think I think uh, psychopathy for a non psychopath is not something that can be fully grocked. Okay, and that's I a guess, sentence I never thought well, I would say, but it can't be. It can't be <laughs> because to fully grock something, it actually has to become a part of you, and maybe you don't want yes. to. <laughs> I, I think that's right. It's it's sort of beyond you, um, and it, it might actually be that it's something less than you are, and because you're something more, you can't grasp the lessness of it. So, okay. for it's example, like contemplating the mind of an ant or something like that. Exactly. So, an ant is, is a it's a lower form of life um, relative to the things we can't do. So, you can't imagine what it's like to be an ant because if you did, then you, for example, would lack the capacity of imagination, mm-hmm. and you kind of assume. You kind of see, I think you're looking for a sensation. What would it be like to feel like an ant? But it's more than just a sensation. It's also a great limitation. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think it's interesting to reflect on that. Another way of thinking about it is um, we, we abide in the third dimension. So uh, can we imagine what, what it would be like to live in the second dimension? Um, well, we can sort of, we can sort of like, squash that third dimension down, imagine it's flat, you know, we can't see up or down. But, and we can't really fully understand that. We can understand it by analogy. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately can't because we're more than the second dimension. We can't lose that extra dimension we have. And by the same token, if we think of the fourth dimension, we can sort of understand that by analogy. We could say what it would be like for people in two dimensions to understand the third dimension is kind of what it would be like for people in our dimension, three dimensions, to understand the fourth dimension. 
and you can sort of, sort of get your head around it, but it, that's that. So you, but not quite. You can't fully grok it. Well, so I just take I, a couple of hits of acid and. Well, yeah. So, so yeah. So apparently, uh, yeah, DMT helps you helps you understand. You, you should get chatting to the uh, self replicating machine elves. Yeah. Um, and that's what people say. People say when they've taken it and they come back, they say, "Well, I can only half describe what it was like. It was the profusion or the dimensionality is just a bit too much." I can't even fully remember it, um, so I, I I hesitate to pronounce on what exactly is going on there. But it will be consistent with some sort of uh, mind dimensional expansion that can't quite be articulated when you get back to the third dimension. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so that's also what it's like to think of psychopathy. <laughs> yeah. So I think. Yeah. So just to just bring it back to Earth a little bit, um, yeah. I think that we we can't understand psychopaths because they lack something we have, mm. but also they can't understand us because, well, they lack something we have. Um, um, so I think there's actually we might assume that because they are fellow human beings, or they might assume because we're all fellow human beings. Um, that we're actually mutually intelligible, but I think we're not. I think I think there's I think there's a level of mutual non intelligibility between us that can be underappreciated. And people who deal with psychopaths often have this experience that they're dealing with a per- they assume they're a regular person, and suddenly they do something out of character, or the mask comes off, and they're like, "What the hell? What is this?" So not only are they stressed and and manipulated or or abused, but they're also like, "I I, I can't possibly understand how come someone could be like that." This is very, very puzzling. It, it does make me wonder about myths, like about vampires, and they, you know, they have the ability right. to change right. the bats. So I wonder yes. if that's related. Yeah. So I, I think, I think one function of mythical stories, stories that have archetypes, is to alert us to, you know, aspects of human nature, many of which are disturbing, including things like fairy tales. And yeah, I think there's a lot of mileage in the the vampire the vampire analogy. Uh, you you could you could look at a few things. So firstly, you know, vampires are sort of dead inside; they're not quite as enlivened as regular human beings. Um, they're subject to certain cravings that must be satisfied. Uh, they're predatory. The creatures of the night, you know, from a the point of view of good or evil, they can't stand the uh, the sunlight, and they don't want to be exposed. They don't want to. <laughs> Although I saw I saw a funny cartoon recently, which this person tells a vampire, you know that light from the moon? That's actually reflected sunlight, so you better watch out. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and then oh, the other thing about it, you can't really bargain, can't really bargain with vampires. Um, you have to kill, if you're going to have any dealings with them, you, uh, you just put a stake to the heart and that's that. Hmm. Um, you so know, that relates to your, your framework. Yeah. Yeah. And then things like uh, you have to let the vampire into your life. You know, there's a movie about that. Let the let the right one in. It's called. And you know, so it's kind of like you're a little bit responsible for what vampires might do for you. So I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of analogy in that. Also, uh, shape shifting lizards. Mm-hmm. At Anarcho Poco this year, I believe uh, David Ike gave a talk. I think it was four hours long. He specializes in these these marathon marathon sessions. <laughs> um, yeah, I think some of them go for ten hours or something. Yeah, like he deserves a medal for for sheer stamina, I think. Uh, yeah, but he he, you know, so okay, shape shifting lizards, interdimensional entities. Um, people might be skeptical, but at a met- at a metaphorical point of view, that also maps on to aspects of psychopathy, which like, maybe we're kind of putting the harp, cart before the horse here. But um, one thing you do find is that they are um, quite adept at projecting a persona or mask. The function of which is to manipulate others, and behind the mask there might not be very much. Uh, they might only be a series of mask producers. So that that shape shifting quality is maybe what's referred there. Also, that they're lizards. Um, lizards are a more primitive form of life. Uh, form of life that's more directed by um, you know basic basic desire. Right. They don't have Freud that an alien brain. That's right. So it's, it's not not moderated. It's it's sort of sort of direct. So from an analogical point of view, uh, from a mythical point of view, these sort of stories I think do tell you they do try to capture something about the the reality of psychopaths. And also I think what they try to they try to do justice to it at at a deeper metaphysical level. If you look at the 
research literature on psychopathy, of which there there is a lot, um, it takes a somewhat clinical, uh, you know, rigorous but but kind of a dry approach to the phenomenon, and it makes assumptions about human nature. You know, maybe that you know, fundamentally, we're creatures shaped by evolution. Uh, really, when it gets right down to it, we're just biological entities, just like all the other animals in the universe. And that's more or less the whole story. And any other story is a bit airy fairy and probably should be dismissed on skeptical grounds. So a very naturalistic, materialistic interpretation of of human nature. That that's what modern science says. But I think at, at least a lot of the myths that they, they you mentioned, the vampire myth, the shape shifting lizard myth. Um, they are trying to do justice to deeper levels of psychopathy, the existential level, the spiritual level, things like that. So I think in getting to grips with the phenomenon, they certainly have their place. Um, yes, yeah, so, but maybe we should, we should, we should start off uh, more simply or, or continue yes, more simply. Yes. Um, well, tell, uh, yeah. tell us about the idea of the poco curante. Okay, well, that, that's, kind of, that's already a kind of um, a new gloss on, on psychopathy. So maybe we should okay. like, just, just right. discuss psychopathy first. Yeah, um, sure, sure. So, so you know, it's, the question arises, what, what, is, what is a psychopath or what is psychopathy? When you ask the question, I think you assume that an answer could, in principle, be given. So if I say, you know, what is a flower? Well, you can give me a definition of a flower and show me some flowers. And you can do that for many things. But when you get to many psychological constructs, psychological ideas, so not just psychopathy and psychopaths, maybe, you know, self-esteem, people with high self-esteem or schizophrenia or schizophrenics, Mm -hmm. um, the assumption is that there is an answer to the question. We can give you the answer. And you consult an expert Hi, there's Dr. Aiden P. Gregg. He will tell you the real meaning of psychopathy, the real meaning of schizophrenia or whatever, that there are experts out there who know versus who don't. But there's a problem, there's a problem with that assumption. So I think you can describe the problem like this. Um, let's take physical diseases. Physical diseases, have, there, for them, there is a distinction between signs and symptoms of a disease. Signs so, and symptoms. Signs and symptoms. Okay. So a person will go to a doctor and say, hey, doc, I'm having these symptoms. Um, so they go in and say, you know, I've got a high temperature. Um, I'm feeling suddenly fatigued, feeling weak. Um, I have a dryness at the back of my throat and, uh, and so forth. And um, it came on suddenly. I was otherwise in good health. It's winter time. And the doctor says, ah, these symptoms, these seem to converge on a disease entity we call the flu. Now, if I wanted to, <clears throat> I could go, I'd take a blood sample and I could... Uh, show that, that flu viruses are replicating uh, at great speed in your bloodstream and, and elsewhere, and they're, they're hijacking your cells and, and, and replicating it like, like a virus typically does. And there would be tests for that. Those test results you could, you could regard as more or less definitive signs okay. based on biology, which are producing this array of symptoms. Now, the symptoms themselves wouldn't necessarily be conclusive maybe a person has an exotic tropical disease and not the regular flu. With these physical diseases, we can go straight to the point. We can look at the actual literal cause of the disease. And that's a sign. Yeah. So, so essentially, there is a physical pathology underlying it. And we can diagnose that in many cases, not all, sometimes there's ambiguity, but in many cases, many standard cases, we, we can say, you know, there's, there is this physical pathology. There are definite signs for it. How do we know what the symptoms mean? We can relate the symptoms to the signs or to the definitive tests. Okay. Um, now, there are some d- disease entities we can't do that for, which are a bit odd, like um, uh, diseases like um, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. So there are some, some oddities. But for things like diabetes, you know, there's a cluster of symptoms. You know, maybe you're feeling tired. Maybe uh, you're, you, you want to drink a lot. Maybe you're going to the bathroom a lot. Uh, and also, you know, maybe you're a bit heavy and you have a lot of sugary substances. Um, and, you know, the doctor puts this together and they do some tests and lo and behold, yes, you know, you have, you have, the, you have this disorder. So that's medicine. What about psychiatry or psychology? Now, the problem here is there's no distinction between symptoms and signs. Really, all you have are symptoms. One assumption would be, well, really, there are signs. If, if you went deep enough into the brain and we knew enough, enough about the brain, we would actually find the physical pathology that underlies it. Because presumably, whatever is going on in your brain when you're depressed, 
if there's definitely something going on in your brain, we just haven't characterized it fully yet, shall we say. Yeah. But if that so was the case... like the, the broken brain hypothesis, is right. the, the idea that everything could be related to the chemistry in the brain. Sure. And at one level analysis, that has to be true. So we're having a conversation here. Someone could easily, well, not easily, but they could put, put a brain scanner on us and like, oh, you know, different parts of the brain are lighting up. Uh, this is the neural basis of conversations on the internet. Hmm. Sure. Well, there has to be because like our brains are working. We're, we are at least partly biological organisms. So it must be true in a very trivial sense. So in a very trivial sense, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, whatever, they all have some sort of physical description of the brain and probably one that's generalizes across individuals. I mean, that just must be true. It's, it's not a finding. It's just, it's just, it's almost like a truth that must necessar necessarily be true if you assume people have brains. Yeah. So it's, it's not very profound in many ways. But if that was the case and we, we did that, then essentially this would be a branch of neurology. We'd say, okay, we're talking about brains now and they relate to these symptoms. So we do know there are some conditions like that. If we take dementia, for example, you know, we know there's, there's parts of the brain are deteriorating that produces certain symptoms. That's really a neurological um, condition because we, we can make the link. But for many things like anxiety and depression, we, we're not at that level of analysis in the brain and we may never be at that level of analysis in the brain because the phenomenon itself um, might, not be, not, might not relate to processes that can be described simply. And as a matter of fact, at the moment, we're certainly very, very far away from that. So for a whole bunch of neuroses and indeed even for many psychoses like schizophrenia, we are very far away from understanding what it is in the brain that's going on. So if you took pictures of people's brains who had anxiety or not, schizophrenia or not, um, it was very difficult to tell who's who. You, you, you'd probably tell above chance with enough pictures, but not much above chance. Um, so really, we're just dealing with symptoms. There's no hard physical basis that would give us a definitive test or a definitive sign that someone had a particular disorder. So what we're really doing is that we're looking, we're looking at the surface of things and things are clustering in different ways and things have different meanings. And we're saying, okay, I'm going to draw a circle around this thing and a circle around this thing and a circle around this thing. And that's a thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm an expert. Oh, so people say you can look at things like serotonin levels and dopamine levels to diagnose depression from, from everything that you know, that, that's not really true. There are some correlations. Although in the case of serotonin, that hypothesis has been put forward, um, but it's, it hasn't been super productive. Um, for things like, uh, things like schizophrenia, people have said, oh, well, it, it's some disorder in, in dopamine production levels. And you'll have a lot, lot of studies and they will find differences in people diagnosed with and without. But again, it's not super predictive. So let, let me give you an analogy. How can you tell if somebody's lying? There are a few signs that they are. One sign, which you find, is uh, people's voice has a higher pitch when they're lying. It's not too surprising because uh, it can be slightly stressful to lie. And some people lying are a bit anxious about it or a bit excited about it. Uh, and that registers uh, by, by moving the voice up a little bit. And there are indeed some bits of mechanical kit which can... Uh, analyze this more sensitively than the human ear and these are marketed as lie detection devices and that's fine but here's what it isn't like it isn't like pinocchio's nose it isn't like every time someone lies uh their voice uh, increases in pitch it isn't like there are no differences in people's pitch you know initially um so yes if you had a large group of people who were lying and not you know a thousand people who are lying thousand people telling the truth um, using this instrumentation, we could tell the difference, but maybe like 55% of the time. Um, so it's diagnostic of it, but it's, it's, it's very weakly diagnostic of it. So all these things you hear about serotonin, dopamine, different regions of the brain lining up versus not, these are all weakly diagnostic of conditions. But you'll find plenty of people who don't, you know, take that box. And indeed, maybe even the majority won't take that box. So it tells you something about it. Like uh, maybe even a simpler example is height. Okay, men and women differ in height. You, you tell me no information about somebody except their height. Now, if the height is very high, it's pr probably going to be a man, and it's very low, it's probably going to be a woman. Right. So, so you it's really need a cluster. You need a whole bunch of data to look okay, at. Okay, well, that's, 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 uh, that, that helps. That's separate. But, but just, my first point is just because you've assigned... 
yes, weekly yes. diagnostic. So in many yes. cases, you can make lots of error. Now, you could improve. You could have many signs. And indeed, that really does help. So if you tell me someone's got a high temperature or not, do they have the flu? Well, you're not telling me very much. Um, has it come on suddenly where they uh, not ill beforehand? Is it the middle of winter? Do they have a dry throat? And, you know, do they have not so much mucus? So it is in their nose, so it isn't a cold. And suddenly, you know, this is, this is forming a pattern and it's, it's probably going to be the flu. So mm. multi multiple criteria help. And there are multiple criteria for, for the disorders. But again, the problem is with the flu, there is an underlying thing. In the case of uh, psych psychological disorders, you really only have the surface. You only have the symptoms. And really what we're trying to do is draw circle, the best circles we can around them to make the most sense of what we have. I, thought, I was, I was t teaching my class about uh, a related issue in personality, and I thought of the following analogy recently about musical genres. What, what are the ultimate musical genres? The ultimate. <laughs> yeah, what, what's, what is the best description of all musical genres? Yeah, there's no definitive guide. Exactly. You kind of have to feel it out. Right. Now, we know, we know there's people like classical music or classical, and there's rock. Hmm. And really, they're pretty distinction. But you can't have classic rock. There's such a thing. Yeah, they're not, and you they're can not have metal versions of symphonies and right, yeah. right. So there's a lot of mixing and matching. Hmm. Um, but if someone said to me, "What's the what's the ultimate best way to classify these genres?" I think you can understand there really is no ultimate way. There are some ways that are better than others, hmm. um, and there's some type of music that's kind of ambiguous, right? So, like, let's take Beethoven. Is Beethoven a classical composer or a romantic composer? Well, it's tricky. If you go to his late works, it's definitely more romantic. The early works basically sound like Mozart, and then he, he makes a smooth transition. So it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, so actually, I, I, think, I think this analogy is very productive. Another way it's productive is precisely what you say. Like, you can have overlaps between the genres. Mm -hmm. in, in psychiatry, in psychology, that's called comorbidity. Oh, this person has a touch of, you know, a touch of bipolar sort of, and a touch of schizophrenia as well. You know, they're a bit psychotic and a bit, and a bit depressed. Oh, it's comorbid. They have both. Right. Well, um, just to clarify that term, because when you, when you first mentioned it to me, I was confused. So mor morbid in this case, it doesn't mean that, that it doesn't mean it should relate to death. It means it relates to illness. Right. So uh, the term morbid has everyday meanings and, and specific meanings. So mm. a morbid in its everyday meaning kind of, does mean have to do with death like you know a morbid sensibility someone's you know talking about death a lot but actually in epidemiology um and uh and medicine morbidity means sickness as opposed to mortality which means death mm -hmm. so cold morbid means having two sicknesses at the same time so you know i i stubbed my toe and had a cold i'm comorbid for a stubbed toe and, 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 and a cold. That, that's, you know, they like using <laughs> these big terms. Like, you've got both sicknesses, yeah. Um, okay. But you can define those physically. But when you say you're comorbid, you know, like, it's almost like saying Beethoven was comorbid morbid for classicism and romanticism. <laughs> you know, it's like, is that the best way to describe it, that he was both classical and romantic? Or, or you know, was he, you know, was he just what he was? Right. This comorbid, comorbidity thing is, is kind of like an escape hatch to draw away attention from the fact that things are just very messy and things don't really fit into the nice categories they think they are. And you can never go beyond the, the surface because you can never get to the, the definitive signs or the test results that will tell you it's one or the other. It's just basically making sense of the, the landscape. Hmm. There's, no, there's no deeper thing. So this is a very important point. It's a point that applies to all um, clinical syndromes. It applies to different... Uh, the way you might understand personality, and it applies to psychopathy. So what people call psychopathy reflects not their diagnosis of necessarily underlying thing, but the way they conceptualize a symptomatic landscape. And different people will put different things into the psychopathy circle, and different people will have a wider circle or an narrower circle. And how do we decide between them? Who's right? Well, let me tell you a bit of a history. So um, the history, the recent history at least of psychopathy, um, go, going back to like 1900s, people used to call it moral insanity. So there were these people and they weren't, um, they had the following characteristics. They weren't that neurotic. So they weren't saying, woe is me, you know, nothing has any meaning, I'm, I'm crying, I'm worried about everything. 
They weren't like that. Nor were they like, um, oh, the moon is made of blue cheese. I, I'd, like, I'd like to taste some of it. So they, they, were, they were neither neurotic nor psychotic. Uh-huh. So uh, there, there are different ways to describe that division. Uh, one is um, the neurotic person says, one on one is equal to two. I can't stand it. <laughs> the, the psychotic person says, one on one is equal to 11. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Okay. okay, but that must mean, that would mean he's manic as well, right? <laughs> it's, that, that's right. That's, that's right. He would mean he's manic. Comorbid. <laughs> Comorbid. Or not, another another way to put it is um, the uh, the neurotic builds castles in the air, uh, whereas the psychotic lives in them, um, and the psychiatrist collects the rent. In both cases. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the point about the psychopaths is that they're neither neurotic nor psychotic. They are psychopathic. They're, they're morally insane. Right. Um, and, and indeed, that, that's sort of a, a, a good general way of, of, of thinking about them. So that, that's, that, that's how they were initially class, uh, classified. But then a guy called Cleckley, Hervey Cleckley, wrote a book, uh, I think in the, the original edition was 18, 1930, 1940, called The Mask of Sanity. And he had a lot of patients coming into them, and he found them very puzzling. Um, most of them came from middle to upper class backgrounds. And what was odd about them was they would come in, and they'd often talk a good game. They would, they would come across as being quite well-adjusted individuals. But then um, they came in, and they did all sorts of weird things. So a lot of them were very feckless. They couldn't get their lives together. Uh, they were kind of impulsive. They showed signs of not really giving too much of a shit about other people on many occasions. Uh, they were quite good at manipulating him. He called the book The Mask of Sanity because they came across superficially as sane. But when you looked into their lives, there was a big disconnect between what they talked about and what they actually were. So he came up with a, a checklist, the Cleckley checklist. It's almost like a tongue twister. <laughs> and then another guy called Robert M. Hare, um, who's written a few books. And he's sort, of, he's sort of the main guy. It's about 85 now. He's the main guy for psychopathy. Um, he wrote a book called Without Conscience and another book called Snakes and Suits, mm. where he's talking about psychopaths. And he came up with the hair checklist. Right. So this is the psychopath test that John Ronson wrote a book about. Is that um, Yeah. I, um, he may have been referring to the – he probably was referring to the hair checklist, yes. So Don Ronson is, um, is a more popular author who has who's written some, some books about this um, and some other, other sort of funny books. Um, yeah, I read the book. One one uh, interesting note in the book, uh, which always stuck with me, was he reported in one of the chapters about an intervention to help psychopaths, and they were given empathy training. Yeah, um, because you know, if there's one thing that these morally insane people lack, it's like empathy for the fellow man. So why don't we just train them? You know, it's like people lacking typing skills. Let's put them through the typing program, and they learn to type. Yeah. So they gave them this empathy training anyway, and they followed them up. And they found that the psychopaths in giving empathy training um, reoffended at a higher rate than those who had not. So what happened was they hadn't learned to be empathic. They learned, it's at least one interpretation, they learned to fake empathy more effectively. <laughs> yeah, um, to read and, people so they could manipulate them better. Exactly, exactly, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that, that goes to the point that um, psychopaths are difficult to rehabilitate. Psychotherapy sort of works, sort of helps neurotics in general. They do a little bit better. Um, psychosis is harder to treat, but psychopaths are almost almost impossible to uh, treat if if it's if it's quite a serious uh, um, shade of it. Yeah. Mm. So, yes, yeah, the psychopath test. There are are all these. Uh, it, it, essentially, it's a checklist, and um, the higher you score, the higher you know you score. So there's a whole bunch of things. They include like things like um, some personal things like being charming, um, superficial emotion, uh, a grandiose self-view, and then more behavioral things like um, being um, uh, pathological liars, being impulsive, uh, doing things, and then a whole bunch of like uh, sort of criminal behaviors. Uh, criminal versatility was one of the things. If, if you're a criminal and you do all sorts of different crimes instead of specializing or generalist, that's one of the items on, on the on the hair check. That's- it's a nice poetic uh, phrase, isn't it? Universe, it's almost like it's a positive thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. You put put on your CV, you know. I, I, yeah. I'm not just into robbery and rape, but you know, I, I basically I, I, I specialize in anything you, you care to throw my way. You know, fraud. I'm also fraud. I did fraud. Yeah. Um, so this is a list. Now, 
it's almost like this list is the gold standard. This is what a psychopath is. This is how we measure it. But but how do we know? Well, R.M. Hare has lots of experience. He read Cleckley's checklist. And he's sort of the first person really to come up with a checklist. So everybody uses the checklist. Right. Um, so is, is that is it definitive? What, right. How do you know? You don't know. All you can say is he's probably an observant clinician. These things hang together. But there are problem with checklists. For example, are all the items on the checklist of similar weight? The checklist assumes that they all are unit weighted, equally important. But one might be more important than others. So there's a checklist have that disadvantage. Hmm. But do you know, right? So someone else could come along and say, well, this is, this is how I interpret the landscape. Now, just to give you an example of interpretational difficulties, uh, let's take uh, three groups of people. Criminals, people who end up in the criminal justice system, people with antisocial personality disorder, and psychopaths. Now, these groups overlap, but they're not the same. Hmm. So let's say criminals. Okay, some people are put in jail um, for dealing marijuana. Okay. Now, if we take the standard libertarian view, we all know marijuana, whatever its disadvantage, is less harmful than alcohol, which is freely available. And, you know, if someone's going to prison for that, are they really a criminal? I mean, how much damage do they do? You know, they made people, you know, just get baked instead of violent and out in the street. I mean, how bad were they? Yeah. So just because someone is a criminal doesn't mean they're bad. And there are many people in criminal, I think, who are just, they're not, they're not, they're not bad people. Okay. You know, they've, they do some bad things and that's, that's not good and, and they should be condemned, but um, there's hope for them. They're redeemable. That's a large chunk of people in there. Then there are people with antisocial personality disorder. And that's a, that's a category that exists in the DSM, or whatever number it is now, five revised, uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the Bible of Mental Disorder. Mm. Um, and this Bible is put together really because people recognize that, you know, there's so much, so much subjectivity and lack of reliability in psychiatric diagnoses. Maybe we'll just specify a whole bunch of things and that'll improve agreement. Yeah. But that's just sort of specifying things in advance. But anyway, antisocial personality <laughs> disorder is, is in there. It's part of personality yeah. disorders. Yeah. Is the checklist in there very similar to Hare's checklist? Or it's the- no, and, and, and my, my point is they're not the same thing. Uh-huh. In any case, so psychopathy—that's what the checklist wants to define. But antisocial personality disorder—that's that, that's a bro- that's a broader a broader a broader category. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, so it's almost like anti- you know, most people with antisocial personality disorder would be criminals, but maybe not everybody. Um, and then, if you go one further, you have psychopaths. So psychopaths would be a smaller would be maybe a subcategory of antisocial personality disorder which are both a subcategory maybe of criminals. So if you look at criminals, only, you know, maybe half of them have antisocial personality disorder, maybe that's too high, but only, you know, maybe 25% will be psychopaths. So already you have this issue of how big is the circle, right? Clearly, clearly criminals are getting up to no good and, you know, uh, stealing things and violating the non-aggression principle occasionally. They don't, they don't have to. Like, again, you, you, can, you can sell weed and still go to prison. But the antisocial personality disorder, well, these people, these people have a problem. You know, these people are uh, a bit more hard-assed. And then more hard-assed again are the psychopaths. So you, you might say it's just like, you know, really, really problematic people uh, are psychopaths. But then it gets, it, gets, it gets more complicated because you can be a psychopath without, without being a criminal. Yes. Because it's a psychopath. Or without being a convicted criminal. Or without being a convicted criminal, right. Um, but maybe even without like committing, doing anything bad, you can be like what they call a well-adjusted psychopath. Hmm. Now, this brings us to the word sociopath. That has a few meanings, all of which are, are very vague and which are very fluid in many ways. And I think actually that's a good word to describe psychiatric classifications. They're very fluid. Now, there's a big debate at the moment about whether or not gender is fluid. I would, I would tell you what I think, but I might get into trouble. <laughs> um, but it's, it's certainly it, the it, case. It's I certainly the case. <laughs> it's certainly the case. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go. On. So it's certainly the case that psychiatric disorders are fluid. So you see them. You see them emerging, right? So someone might just say, you know, let's get rid of psychopathy and let's have antisocial personality disorder. And some might say, no, it's it's this other thing. Um. So the way people talk about it, it may well be this other thing because. Um, you can make a distinction between primary psychopathy and secondary psychopathy. So a secondary psychopathy is basically 
getting into trouble with the law and getting into trouble socially. Primary psychopathy is, well, you have these, these traits which show you're kind of cold-hearted and lack empathy. But there are people like that who don't necessarily become criminals. I mean, they often become politicians. Right. Um, and sometimes well, the term sociopath is applied to them. Surgeons. People say surgeons yes. are also sociopath. Oh. Right. Like, so you, you, you give surgeons, you give people in different walks of life uh, a checklist like this. Or you have other people do the checklist on their behalf. And they will score, high, they will score higher on that. Now, that, that kind of makes sense because if you are a marshmallow, uh, if you are a very sensitive person, and there are people coming in from car crashes on a table in a complete mess, and let's suppose they're kids, um, breaking down crying isn't really an adaptive approach to this uh, if you're a surgeon. If you're a surgeon, it's like, okay, you know, throw that guy in the slab. Let's see what we can do. Let's get, let's get out of here by lunchtime because I want to play golf. Um, that's not very nice, but um, as long as he does the job well and maybe, maybe he's an egotist, he says, well, I can save this, this kid when no one else can. Right. And he goes in and that he... Alan Baldwin's okay. speech about being God. Uh, when yes, I, know, like, I am God. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. That's right. So um, not having empathy getting paid for doing a good job um, and going in there could well be sort of an adaptive response. So it makes sense that they would have some shades of psychopathy. If they were a complete psychopath, then they would probably wouldn't bother becoming a surgeon. But if they have some aspects of it. Now, this actually leads into an interesting point about the constituents of psychopathy. So does this distinction between primary and secondary psychopathy? People have divided it up in other ways. So a common approach now, there are actually two approaches that are sort of converging. There's a thing called the triarchical model of, person, of psychopathy. It says there are three components. Um, and those are boldness, um, disinhibition, and meanness. Hmm. So boldness is something like um, fearless dominance. I am not, you know, uh, uh, I, I am not intimidated by anything or by you. Um, and also I'm kind of keen to be top dog around here. Um, now there's a big debate a few years ago there was a big debate in the literature scientific literature about whether or not fearless dominance should be part of the whole construction at all because fearless dominance doesn't really correlate that well with two other factors namely disinhibition which is being very impulsive um, and uh, not to control yourself and, and doing reckless and dangerous things uh, and meanness which is you know well, basically being an asshole, but, but sort of taking sadistic pleasure in, in, in hurting other people. So the, these emerge as separate clusters of characteristics. And one view is that they, you know, they also all correlate a little bit with each other, although debate has emerged over whether or not boldness should be included. Now, I think maybe not because, I mean, let's take firefighters. Uh, they're doing a good job saving people's lives. Uh, they probably do it because they have a bit of empathy. But, you know, at the same time, they can't be a squish. They have to go into a, burden, a burning building and um, often take, you know, very difficult decisions, too, that, that require you to put your empathy aside. Should I save this crying baby or the other 10 people I know are on the other side of the building, right? If the crying okay. baby's in front of you, you're like, it's like the trolley problem, right? Like, well, yeah. if you were just a squish, like, well, I'll just save the baby. But then 10 more people, right. your, your job is to make that hard decision. And yes, you yes. So they say psychopaths right. find it very easy to answer the trolley problem. There's one, there was one case where some interviewer asked Ed Bush if he would go back in time and kill baby Hitler. And he was like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that sort of thing. So. Yeah. I mean, it might not be popular to say it, but there are sometimes life involves very difficult trade-offs, hmm. and the capacity to put empathy aside helps you. It's also been found, I should point out, that libertarians in general um, are slightly less empathic than non-libertarians, um, and that sort of makes sense because if, if you think about arguments, say for or against the minimum wage, hmm. to say you don't believe in the minimum wage or just even start thinking along those lines is a little bit, you have to be a little bit bloody minded to say, well, let me, let me, you know, let me not think about all those people who are not getting what they should be paid. Now, I think when it, when it turns out, you think, you think it through, you're like, actually, if you are kind hearted, you should be against the minimum wage. Yes. Because it just works out better for everybody. If it, it doesn't sound there, but it doesn't, it doesn't sound good. <laughs> 
it doesn't yeah. sound good. And um, but but even even to get started down that line of thought, which gets you know you start talking about maximizing marginal revenue products or something. But but even even to start down that track, you you have you have to be able to suspend your sentimental. Uh, approach to it. So suspending sentiment, it seems to me, is an important capacity to have, and we, we would value it in firefighters and I think in surgeons. And it certainly isn't sufficient to make you fully a psychopath. And indeed, there's even debate about whether or not boldness should be included in it. But but the classic picture of the psychopath is somebody who is bold and able to disregard social norms and stuff like that. Some people might call that toxic masculinity, indeed. Um, so it, it it does there there is this deep question about whether or not at least facets of psychopathy are useful. I mean, the fact that we have psychopaths with us at all means that maybe perhaps at least some of the traits that they have, if we're going to include boldness in it, and as I said, there's a debate over that. Um, uh, you know, maybe the reason it's there is that it it does have some functionality. I mean, if, if people start going to war. Mm. and all the, the loves come off and it's an intractable conflict, um, the psychopaths are going to do better than the squishes. Mm. And when they come back, you know, they'll, they'll probably reproduce. There's also the interesting ph- phenomenon of hybristophilia, which is that if you're a, if you're a killer, um, you can definitely get a girlfriend. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, Charles Manson has no problem with that's right. conjugal visits. And- yeah, so that's not to say that all women, you know, even the majority of women like him, but 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 there is something in him that um, will render him attractive. So what renders him attractive is this, essentially, the, the toxic masculinity part, or what people would call that, that 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 bold recklessness, which yeah. signifies that you know this is somebody who could be a top dog. Well, it's kind and, of a rock star mentality. It's like right. doesn't matter what the world thinks, I am what I am. You know. <laughs> that's exactly right yes so this is another feature of of uh, psychopath which is grandiosity hmm. um uh, typically psychopaths have a have a rather good view of themselves like they're not neurotic they're not saying things like you know well i don't know really am, am i good enough um they don't second guess themselves so there there isn't this voice in their head telling them you know maybe you shouldn't <laughs> they're just like no obviously obviously i should <laughs> so, so grandiosity is, is part of a constellation too now another distinction has been made because people people are dividing up this territory in different ways so recently uh people have talked about this dark triad of traits so it's not boldness inhibition and meanness but it's machiavellianism which is the extent to which you manipulate people, um, psychopathy, which is the thing we've been talking about, and narcissism, which is having rather too much self-esteem and thinking you're superior. So it turns out you can you can measure these things independently as well. Um, so that's that's yet another way of divide, dividing up dividing up the territory. Um, so you know I don't think there's any definite way of doing it. Um, um, and there are, you know, lots of academic disputes about what should go into it. But the reason they exist, I think, is that there's no definitive way to say how how big you should draw the circle. So in a way, I'm, I'm not a fan of social constructionism and all that sort of, you know, reality is whatever you think it is. But I do think when it comes to when you just have symptoms and no underlying reality, it really is about, you know, what you want to lasso, h- how you want to how you want to define it. And some definitions are better for other purposes. So if you ever cross, come across someone who says, this is what psychopathy is, I'm going to tell you. Well, not really, because they're really telling you, this is, this is the best way to draw lines around things. And it might be better for some purposes, but that's, that's essentially what it boils down to at the end of the day. So everybody's entitled to their own opinion on psychopathy. <laughs> well, it's an interesting question. It's like you have you have a bunch of clusters. Well, okay, it's so another analogy. Like let's let's imagine a country, and it has certain conurbations. So in England, you'll have London and its outskirts. You'll have Southampton. You'll have Oxford. Um, if you were to say, okay, where are the clusters here? You just draw a circle around London, a circle around Southampton, a circle around Oxford. You could draw a circle that goes halfway through Oxford and halfway through London. Yeah. And say this is a circle. 
this is this is a this is a thing. You're like, why is it a thing? It's like, well, I just I just like that thing. Okay, but it does. You know, if we're going to say we're looking for clusters, uh, and we want to talk about what's there, the clusters are at least the guide to what the things are. Now, the example I give them is that there's only one dimension, the dimension of you know where people are, uh, population. But with with psychiatric diagnosis, there are also there are multiple dimensions, which makes it makes it a, a bit a bit of a problem. Yeah, so that that makes it difficult to say. You know, whatever we say about psychopaths, uh, what are we saying it about? You know, so it, it's kind of it, you never the definitional question never really quite quite goes away uh, goes away. But even within that, we can we can I think say some some uh, interesting things interesting things about it. Okay. I'm not sure. Have I left you more confused than you were at the beginning? No, that's good. So, okay. Yeah, so there are many ways to look at psychopathy, and we don't know exactly where the, the boundaries lie. Yeah, but we have a general idea of what, how these type of people think. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening. So this is the first part of a two-part interview. I ha- still have another hour or so to edit and get out to you guys. So you'll be able to hear Aiden's own ideas about the poco curante and what kind of person that is and what kind of experiments that he's doing to try to detect these people in the populace and also about the different variations. So you have some people who don't really care about anything, but certain people will care maybe just about the truth or they'll just care about others or just about their own future and this sort of thing. So there's all these different variations on a theme there. So I hope you'll tune in next time for that. Thanks so much for listening. Take care, be cool, and experience the wonder of life.